Thanks everyone. Um, I think we'll start. We've still got a few panellists joining, um, but we can start introductions because we've got quite a packed agenda today. Um, so first of all, just to say welcome um, and thank you to everyone who has registered and for attending today's um, joint HDIMP and NIHR webinar on accessing data across the UK health data infrastructure. Uh, my name is Lara Edwards and I work at HDI UK leading something called the Data and Connectivity National Core Study, uh, which has worked throughout the pandemic with all of the um, health data infrastructure partners that, that you'll see today and funded um, two of the research teams um, that you'll hear about today. Um, and um, the, the aim of the Data and Connectivity National Core Study was to really enable wider access to priority data sets throughout the pandemic for research. And the aim of today's webinar is to really showcase to researchers across NIR infrastructure and beyond the breadth of data now available to apply for and securely access um, across the UK within secure, trusted research environments, and how to discover and access linked health and non health data for COVID 19 research, um, but also beyond. So we've got a really good agenda today. We've got two research teams, uh, one from the University of Edinburgh and one from King's College London. Um, and they will describe how they've used um, the, um, some of these population level linked data, asset, data assets via trusted research environments in their research. And we've got an array of representatives <laughs> from across um, the UK health data infrastructure who will showcase the data now available and how to access and then finally, at the end, we'll have a session on how to discover and access the research data via the Health Data Research Innovation Gateway. Just some general housekeeping um, before we start. We are obviously running this as a Zoom webinar event, so attendees won't be able to verbally ask questions or raise hands. However, please do pop your questions as we go in um, for panellists in the Q&A function which you should see at the bottom of your screen. And it would be really helpful if you say who your question is for um, and your name and organisation if you would like to. Uh, we are also recording the session and we will make available presentations and slides for we have permission to do so after the event. So that's the housekeeping out of the way. Um, I'll just give a very brief introduction to the Data and Connectivity National Course Study in a moment before we launch into the wider agenda. But first, I would just like to introduce our fantastic co-chair, um, Dr. Mark Toll. Uh, so Mark's Deputy Director of Research Systems at the Department of Health and Social Care and has what looks like a pretty huge remit across NIHR, um, accountable for cross-NIHR policies, including patient public involvement engagement, cross-NIHR data and data digital systems, and research impact transparency and open science. I think that's just um, a small section of your remit, Mark. Um, so I will hand over to you and um, just introduce yourself and say a few words before we um, start on the agenda. Thanks very much, Flora. Um, yes, um, NHR does keep me busy, I must admit. Um, yes, so um, as, uh, as Lara says, I'm, I'm Deputy Director of Research Systems at the Department of Health and, and, and Social Care. Uh, and also part of the, the the senior management team of the National Institute for for Health and Care Research, which, um, as you will know, um, funds over a, a billion pounds worth of domestic health and care uh, research uh, annually. And I'm really really pleased to be uh, co-chairing uh, this uh, session today, because um, data driven health and care research is is very important for the NIHR and and ultimately very important for bringing benefits uh, to, to to patients and uh, and service users and in our NIHR strategy best research for best health at uh, the next chapter we note that embracing uh, the latest developments in technology and research data is is a really key part of our of our commitment to to research uh, excellence and it's, it's our job uh, as the NIHR to ensure that we provide uh, funding to help support the, the, the data and digital infrastructure that drives your research and that ultimately delivers those uh, patient benefits and benefits to the, to, to the NHS and the, 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 the health and care system uh, as, a, as a whole. So um, I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing about the, the diversity of health and care data resources that are uh, available to the research community now, today, uh, and to hear uh, about a couple of great examples of data-driven uh, research that really showcase the utility uh, of the data assets that are uh, available to us today um, across the UK. And um, I hope you all enjoy the session. And 
Back over to you, Laura. So what's happened then and what's been the impact of enabling access to all this data? Well, to date, we've had 296 preprints and papers from research that's enabled by national core study data, data assets and infrastructure. And that's research that's um, been enabled by um, data assets that are now available um, within those um, trusted research environments and across the infrastructure, um, such as um, Open Safely and, and Pew Research. And you'll hear about some of those insights today um, from Stephen Kerr and the Eve 2 team um, and, um, and Catherine Sleeman from um, Cov Park Net. And then finally, this is, um, you know, this was the key aim of the national core studies to, uh, to enable key research that really informs UK wide policy and response. Um, and one of the um, two of the um, examples are up there, but we've worked um, really closely with Sale Data Bank and um, which, which informed and enabled access to uh, lots of new data assets, which enabled them to um, really um, uh, inform their kind of um, Welsh um, government pandemic response policy via the One Wales response. Um, and you'll hear from Stephen Kerr today on how uh, research um, conducted um, by the E2 team in Scotland um, has informed not just national but international response into vaccine safety and effectiveness and modelling. And research across the national core studies um, has directly informed um, policy response via SAGE um, and, and, and various other groups such as Scottish and Welsh governments and, and JCVI. So that's just a really kind of quick introduction um, to the national core studies. And I guess the message I really want to get across is, is, is how the national core studies really accelerated progress um, in enabling the trusted research environments to come together, um, multiple data sets to be onboarded, and really improved and enhanced um, the, uh, the, um, the environments for researchers. So I shall stop there, um, and I'll pass over to Mark, who's going to introduce the next session, um, um, which will focus on um, these two research case studies. Thank you very much, uh, Lara. Yes, so um, we've got about uh, 25 minutes or so uh, for uh, colleagues to uh, talk to a couple of case studies uh, here. So, so we're going to have a presentation and then and then some Q and A uh, on that first presentation, and then uh, we're, we're we're going to do the same on the on the second. So, um, first up is uh, Dr. Stephen uh, Kerr, who's a senior research fellow at the um, Usher Institute at the University of Edinburgh. And Stephen is going to be talking with us about uh, COVID-19 vaccines at pharmacovigilance. Um, so over to you, Stephen. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so next slide, please, I guess. Uh, so first, I'm going to give a, a quick overview of the data assets that are actually available in each country, and then I'm going to talk about uh, a few um, research efforts that we've gone to. Uh, so in each country, we have data sets consisting of pseudonymized linked electronic health records from primary care, which is derived from uh, GPs, uh, secondary care, which is hospitals. We have death records, uh, vaccinations. COVID-19 testing, and we have some prescription information available too. And it, there's a little bit of variation uh, by TRE, um, but that's more or less what, what, each, um, which, what each TRE has. So they're, they're held in separate secure trusted research environments, that's what TRE stands for, uh, in each nation. And you can, if you follow the link at the bottom, um, you'll be able to find out more information. It's a, a, a playlist from a DACFAP2 webinar that we did, which uh, goes into more detail about the the uh, data assets that we have. Uh, next slide. So in England, uh, the data comes from the Royal College of General Practitioners Research and Surveillance, RCGPRSC, which is based at the University of Oxford. And the coverage is about 32% of the population of England or about 19 million people. And uh, yeah, the link there gives information on how to uh, access. Uh, next slide. In Scotland, so uh, the Eve2, Eve2 is the name of the platform that we have in Scotland. So it's early pandemic evaluation and enhanced surveillance of COVID-19. And we have full pop population coverage. So uh, 5.4 million people in Scotland. And the data is stored on public, a public health Scotland server. And uh, most work so far has been done there. Uh, so the access is limited to approved researchers. However, um, Eve2 is 
migrated to the national safe haven which is a different environment so it's still managed by public health scotland but it is hosted at epcc at the university of edinburgh and that is the um the university of edinburgh's high performance cloud-based uh computing service and it contains most of the same data sets as are available on the phs server and uh yeah to uh get access to it you you can follow the link at the at the bottom uh next slide in Northern Ireland, so health and social care data sets are provided by the Honest Broker Service, and they're held in the SAIL data bank that's secure anonymized information linkage, and that's hosted at the University of Swansea. And uh, again, we have full population coverage in Northern Ireland, which is about 1.9 million people. And uh, again, there's a link at the bottom um, for more details on how to access that data. Uh, next slide. And finally, in Wales, uh, so in Wales, uh, we have the controlling COVID-19 through enhanced population surveillance and intervention or CONCOV uh, cohort, which is also held in the SAIL web, uh, data bank. Uh, so same same location as the Northern Ireland data. And uh, that has full population coverage as well. So about 3.2 million people. And uh, as ever, the link at the bottom tells you how to get more access, uh, access to the, the, the data. Um, next slide. So now I'm going to go through a few uh, research projects that we've done with this data. So this is uh, a study that we did on CVST, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, which is a type of blood clot in the brain that, that causes stroke. And so there were some suggestions um, quite early on that uh, that vaccination um, against COVID might be associated with, with CVST, in particular AstraZeneca. So it's a very rare and serious adverse event. So approximately three to four incidents per million people each year under normal circumstances. But the rareness of the event means that you need quite a lot of data in order to get uh, reliable results. And so we carried out something called a self-controlled case series study um, comparing the rates of CVST in the, in the four weeks following vaccination um, to a baseline period. Next slide. Uh, so that study design allowed us to do a pooled study across the four nations without sharing individual level data. So we um, we, we sort of uh, introduced a, a slight methodological novelty, which essentially allowed us to analyze the data and get a result which is identical to what we would have gotten if all the data started off in the same place. And we did this without sharing any individual level data. So the only data that was shared was uh, completely anonymous uh, count count data. Uh, so counts in, in various categories. Uh, and the main result from that is we found a roughly twofold increased risk of CVST events in the four weeks following um, Ox Oxford AstraZeneca. And uh, the link gives you um, the, the paper, which you can read um, more about there. Uh, next slide. We did uh, a separate study. So this is our study on um, severe breakthrough events. So severe events is COVID-19 hospitalization or death. And this is after receiving three doses of vaccine. So in each country, we fit uh, a Poisson model that included um, lots of predictors. So uh, let's see, it included age, sex, ethnicity, body mass index, uh, being in a high, uh, high risk occupational group, uh, time between first and second dose, uh, whether they previously had an infection, um, socioeconomic status, health board, and QCOVID risk groups. So QCOVID is a, is a risk prediction tool, which um, cr created by uh, Julia hippesley cox and, and her group at the University of Oxford. Uh, so it's, it's predictions for a risk prediction for, tool for um, uh, uh, COVID hospitalization or death. But it um, uses a number of risk groups, uh, which are sort of um, clinical designations. But uh, so in, in each country, um, we, we ran this model and then we um, combined each, uh, each country's model, uh, each country's estimates in a, in a fixed effects uh, meta-analysis. And the main results from that, we found uh, uh, old age uh, being male, uh, being on immunosuppressants and comorbidities, in particular chronic kidney di disease, were all associated with an elevated risk of severe uh, breakthrough events. And the link gives you uh, the paper where you can read more. Uh, next slide. And then the last one is this paper, which has come out very recently, uh, which is a study of first and second dose, uh, waning of first and second doses of uh, AstraZeneca and Pfizer. So we looked at a composite outcome of COVID uh, hospitalization or death. And uh, for first and second, so it was first and second dose, AstraZeneca and Pfizer. And we matched individuals who received the dose with similar individuals that didn't. 
And uh, we did a, so it's called a target trial design. And essentially what we're trying to do here is, is find a naturally occurring clinical trial. So we match uh, very similar people, uh, you know, one of whom received a dose, one of whom didn't. And those are sort of like our, our uh, treatments and, and controls for the, 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 the clinical trial. Um, and uh, that study design allows us to do a pooled study across the four nations as well. So we, we um, use a similar trick to what we did in our study of CVST. And so again, the final result is identical to what we would get if we um, started off with all the data in the same location. Uh, next slide. And so, yeah, pooling was necessary in this case because matched pairs tend to get censored fairly, fairly uh, early due to the control receiving the next dose. And so there weren't many events at large follow-up times. Um, and uh, so our main result here is that for doses one and two of AstraZeneca and dose one of Pfizer, uh, vaccine effectiveness reached zero by uh, approximately day 60 to 80, and then and then went negative. Uh, the negative vaccine effectiveness is interesting, but um, it, it could be a direct consequence of the fact that the, the vaccine provides protection for a relatively short period of time, um, but it all, may also be caused by behavioral effects. So um, people who are vaccinated behaving in ways which are more risky from the point of view of um, you know, bringing them into, into contact with the virus. Uh, also, natural immunity could be um, more robust than, than vaccine-induced immunity, and uh, the paper is at the in the link at the bottom there. Uh, next slide, and uh, this is our acknowledgement slide. So uh, yes, and uh, I think that's it. Is there another slide? There might, might be another one. Ah, okay, there we go. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, we have a few minutes uh, for uh, questions. So if anybody has uh, any any questions that they would like to, to pose, please do type them into the to the Q&A. Um, we, we have one question, um, and this is to Stephen, which is, um, how do you think that the data linkage that was enabled during the pandemic will, will impact future access and, uh, and use of linked data? I don't know if you've got any reflections on that, Stephen. Yeah, so it's a little difficult to tell, but my feeling is that it's going to be a bit of a game changer. Um, so I think what we saw during the, the pandemic is that uh, the, these data sets that that, it, that exist, they just exist, um, and they they uh, they were taken advantage of in, in a in a great way. And um, there were, I mean, there, there were great public health benefits there. They they proved their utility in the in the on the public health front. Um, of course, what you have to balance that against is the privacy concern, right? And this is very legitimate and, it, and it's very serious. We, you know, uh, are people's um, their data and their information secure? And uh, you know, I, I think that uh, one thing that's come out of all of this. So we, for example, were able to do um, these pooled studies without with sharing absolutely minimal data between um, between the, the TREs data, which uh, you know it, it it is really not disclosive in, in any way whatsoever. Um, and so that we, we came up with this sort of slight uh, methodological novelty, which allowed us to do the, the study, um, which uh, you know was very important for informing um, public health policy. And the point is that I, I think that there's a lot of scope for improvements, um, so methodological improvements, which will allow data analyses to happen um, without sharing uh, data. So there's very interesting things happening around the idea of Federated analysis, for example, which is sort of um, it's using sort of series of data resources which are held in different locations, uh, sort of in concert to to do a data analysis on the whole lot, um, and that can be combined with um, there's uh, interesting things happening in, in secure multi-party computation, which uh, is essentially a, a form of sort of uh, uh, let's say encryption, something something like that, but it, it allows you to do an analyses. Um, where you genuinely don't share any information whatsoever, which sounds incredible, but but it is actually true. And so I think it it has um, it's spurred us down that direction a little bit more. There's there's some really interesting possibilities for ways you can do data analysis with these big data sets while respecting privacy and and uh, sharing either minimal or no information whatsoever. Actually, um, so I, I think it's, there's really interesting prospects there. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much for that, Stephen. Um, we've got a question um, here for, for Catherine. Um, and the question is, does the um, palliative end of life data set include adults only? Or were you able to look at uh, pediatric data as, as well? Yeah, so the, the um, answer is that the surveys were filled out by service leads, so they're about services. We did include um, pediatric services, but there are very few of them. 
and um, therefore there were not very many represented in the data. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, I've, I've actually got, got a question um, uh, for, for you both, really, um, uh, Catherine and Stephen, which is whether, g g given given the sheer scale of the, the the data that you looked at and and its complexity and uh, and its linkage, um, do you have any sort of practical sort of hints and tips for uh, researchers who are on the line who want to get into the, the, this level of sort of at scale? Um, sort of national data sets, linking data sets, um, uh, based research. Do you, do, do you have any sort of thoughts or reflections that might give them a sort of a helping hand to get into into the game with this sort of at scale uh, research? Um, I don't know, um, Stephen. Have you any thoughts? Yeah, sure. So for us, uh, it sort of depends on the uh, on the computational environment that that is available. So for us, um, we were largely just doing things in a in a fairly standard way. So I mean, we just used RStudio, and uh, there was nothing um, super complex about it. Although, it's just uh, you end up with with data sets with um, you know millions or tens of millions of of records in them, which um, you know you need you need a, a fairly Big server to deal with that, but you can you can deal with it. it it's a sort of data where, which is it's getting on the cusp of get, getting too big to do <laughs> to do that sort of thing with. It's getting close, but uh, I think um, it, you know in other circumstances you might need to uh, you know I mean I think there are databases available in other countries, so I, I think they connect SQL databases. So SQL SQL is a bit is, it can be useful, I think. Uh, I'm not sure what other types of environments there are. I, I think there's a possibility that in the future you might need. Um, some proper sort of cluster computing and and parallel parallel eh, parallelization to our properly sort of deal with these huge data sets. Um, but yeah, that's that's all I have. Great, thank you, Stephen. Um, and any um, thoughts from yourself, Catherine? Yeah, and I'd like to bring Joanna in as well. I'm sure she has good thoughts. Um, yeah, I mean, I when we first sort of got access or you know understood the extent of the data sets that we could potentially have access to it's actually really overwhelming for us because there was so much there and I'd say it's the really obvious things have a really clear question um the data is massive have quite have, go for a small question at first um rather than something that is just too big to to answer in one step what we've ended up doing is doing things in quite small chunks the other thing that um, was really interesting to hear about from Stephen was about pooling the data and therefore um, analyzing it all together. We've done everything in separate theories, which has added complexity. So um, not thinking too broadly, actually being quite um, having a very clear and focused question. Maybe that only needs one theory in the first instance is it would be my advice. Um, Joanna, do you have anything else? Yeah, I mean, similar to Stephen, in, in lots of respects, it's it's very similar to doing any other analysis that you would that you would be normally doing. And um, we've worked mostly in Stata. Um, but each of the TREs is different and you have to kind of get your head around each of the different processes around access and extracting data. And for example, in the BHF environment, we've worked quite closely with the with the data handlers there to who extract and curate the data for us using something called Databricks, which I had never used before and, you know, is a whole kind of skill set that we don't have in the research team, but working with the, the experts at VHF, we're able to kind of curate the data that we need. So, yeah, from, from a kind of practical point of view, having um, a good working relationship with all of the different TREs and understanding who to ask when you need a bit of help has been really useful. Excellent. Okay. Well, um, that's that's very very helpful indeed. Um, th there's more questions coming in, but unfortunately the clock's against us, and 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 we 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 really do have to move on. But um, huge thanks, uh, Stephen, Catherine, and uh, Joanna for your uh, for your insight. And there's um, lots of thank yous coming in uh, on the on the chat there. So thank you very much, and um, over to you, Lara. Thank you very much. And just to say, we will try and um, and ensure that we are. Um, um, we're answering all the questions on follow-up and we can send those round. I saw a couple, of, a couple of questions on how feasible it was to access the data and any issues that the teams had around that, and we can certainly provide some feedback around that. 
Um, so just a quick note to attendees for this session. We're going to have, we've got quite a lot of panellists across the UK health data infrastructure. And the aim of this session is to really to, um, introduce you to all of them, get a feel for what data sets are available and how to access. And each one is going to give a three minute intro, but please do put your, um, your questions in the Q&A as, as they're talking and we'll collate them all at the end. Because at the end, we'll have a kind of 20, 25 minutes panel session um, where we can go through each of those and really um, ensure that you get a feel of what data is available. Um, so first of all, I'm going to hand over to Kimberly Watson and, and Helen Buckles from NHS Digital. Um, and they're going to do a bit of a double act actually with Lynn Morris and Kathy Sedlow from the BHF Data Science Centre. Kimberly and Helen will talk about data that's available now um, in, the, um, in the NHS Digital um, Trusted Research Environment and, and Development Plans. Um, right, I'll hand over to you Kimberly. Thank you. So um, I'm going to present, I'm Helen Buckles, um, and then I, I'm going to hopefully hand over to Kimberly, who can answer your questions. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Helen. I work for NHS Digital, and I've been working on the SDE programme. Um, for those of you um, who are not familiar with the acronym, it's the Secure Data Environment, but we do like acronyms in NHS Digital, so there's going to be a lot of them. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview on what the SDE is, where we are currently with the programme and what we hope for in the future. So what is SDE? It's fundamentally has the same capability as the TRE or the DAE but it does come with some improved functions and they are things like improved collaboration space using Windows Data Store, um, access to more analytical tool functionalities and a new virtual desktop experience. So we are hoping that there will be improved functions in the secure data environment. So where we are currently, we are in private beta so private beta is a small group of users that have been invited to look at the environment, test the environment, and we are gathering feedback from them to hopefully carry on improving the system. The feedback so far has been positive, um, and obviously we've taken all the user feedback and, and collated it. So where we're going in the future, the extended private beta we are hoping will come into play at the end of November. Now that will also include a small group of new customers, but also the migration of current TRA and DAE users. They will be migrated over to SDE and they will also be testing the environment and will continue to gather feedback from these customers. We are hoping to open our doors to new customers and the environment in spring 2023. Just to also say if anybody on this call is interested in being part of private beta, the expressions of interest are live. So if you want to drop your name and email address in the chat function, I'll certainly get some information over to you. Could we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So currently, uh, the data roadmap, this is the data that's currently available in SDE. What we are doing is gathering the feedback from the user groups to see what are the most frequently requested data sets. And we're using that to prioritize the data that we're going to be onboarding into SDE. But that will continue right into um, spring 2023 when we hope it will go live. Um, as I say, I am going to stay on and I've also got my colleague Kimberly Watson, so happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks very much, Kimberly. I'm going to go straight on to, um, I think Lynn's going to uh, present for us um, for the BHF Data Science Centre. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Lynn Morris. I'm Operations Director at the BHF Data Science Centre. Um, and I'm going to talk about the uh, CBD COVID UK COVID Impact Consortium and, and Programme of Work, which we've um, we, we're working in uh, England, Scotland and Wales, and we're looking to work in Northern Ireland as well. But I'm going to focus on the work that we've done with NHS Digital in accessing the data within their trusted research environment um, to actually answer quite a lot of important questions around the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So CBD COVID UK was um, looking at the uh, impact of COVID-19 on cardiovascular disease, and we extended that 
to all health conditions, which is where COVID impact comes from. Uh, so this schematic just gives you an idea of, of the, the data sets which Helen actually helpfully um, showed uh, in the, the previous slide, um, the data that we have access to, um, and it's not individual data sets necessarily that I've, I've list, listed here, but uh, types of data. And where the data isn't necessarily originally held by NHS Digital, it flows into NHS Digital and we select it. Um, so that it's in that one environment, it's linked and it, it, the identifiers are removed and then it's put in this trusted research environment, which accredited uh, users can then securely access for approved projects. Um, so in order to, um, I don't know if you can see at the bottom, actually, there should be a link uh, to the CBD Cover UK project page and you can find out a lot more information about projects running, different data sets used and outputs that, that have come out of this project. And the consortium itself is, has got 320 members at the moment, um, and that's a, a wide range of expertise, but does obviously include clinical and health data science. Um, and we've got 40 projects, different projects running in this program for it. So uh, next slide, please, Laura. So in order to actually submit a project through this, this route to access the, the data, uh, you need to join the, the consortium, and that's very straightforward. Uh, you need to sign up to uh, non-contentious principles of participation, which are mainly around open and team science. Um, and so what that allows is for you to actually propose a project. So just on the left-hand side, the Data Science Centre actually coordinate this program of work. So they've actually done all of what well, we've all done, all of the necessary approvals um, to get uh, uh, the uh, REC and the different approvals from the different countries to access this data. So there's no need to go through that step. So the, the users um, that want to, to use the, the data in our, in our uh, TRE instance, just submit a project to us. Uh, we have a, a health data science team um, and a project management team that will triage that and it, it will be iterative so we can um, help uh, people that are proposing projects to, to refine and ensure that the questions they're asking uh, can be answered with the, with the data that's available. Uh, so once, once that's finalised, that project is uh, submitted to uh, Oversight Board, which is reviewed by um, a number of different people, it includes uh, what I've called the TRE providers, but obviously uh, this instance would be NHS Digital if it's going to be using data from their environment, but also uh, joint data controllers, so other um, members from other organisations that are using this data and are part of the consortium, but also public contributors. Uh, this is a fairly rapid process, and so uh, projects are re reviewed and uh, responses uh, given within a few weeks of submission. Um, and then once we've got to that stage and the project is actually approved, um, we can actually um, provide access for the relevant analysts in that project. And that can be, um, we obviously comply with the requirements for the different data provide, uh, TRE providers to give uh, the, the re researchers access. And then also once the, the researchers are within that environment, we've got a, a growing health data science team that um, Joanna has already alluded to that help with data management and, and data curation and provide a lot of support for, for the researchers. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there, Laura. You're on mute. Sorry, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm going to head straight over to the Office of National Statistics. And um, to Bill South, who's going to give us an overview of this GOV set service. Thanks, Lara. Can you can you all see me? Yeah. Can you can you hear me? We can. <laughs> Great, fantastic. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, the the next slide, please. Um, so the ONS is secure research service is our trusted research environment. Um, we were accredited as a data processor. For the provision of data under the Digital Economy Act in August 2019. Uh, next slide, please. The, we, we operate under the Five Safe framework, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but essentially only accredited people can access the environment. They, they first have to do training and pass an assessment. Uh, once they've done that, they can apply uh, to, to, to use the system and have a project. Um, that too has to be accredited. Um, the project has to be in the public good. It, it's got to be feasible, um, it, 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 it's, it's got to consider ethics, and there's a commit, commitment to transparency, um, and the data owners have to approve it in principle before it's, it's approved by an independent research accreditation panel. Um, 
once accredited, they get access to the data. All data in the SRS is uh, record level, but de-identified. So names and addresses and personal identifiers stripped out. The, the access arrangements are, are, are tightly controlled. Um, so uh, there's no access to the internet while um, people are using the environment. And in terms of the outputs, um, anything that leave the, leaves the environment is checked, a uh, two person check. Uh, to, to ensure that nothing disclosive leaves the, the, the environment. So a very brief summary of the five safes. Um, SRS in numbers, uh, we've got about 5,000 accredited researchers, um, over 600 live projects. Um, yeah, we, I submitted these slides uh, a few weeks ago and we're now up to 131 uh, data sets that are uh, available to accredited researchers to apply for. And just to give a scale of the kind of operation, we're clearing about 2,000 um, output requests every year. Next slide, I think, is around the data. Okay, so uh, slide here just on the on the COVID and health related data sets in the SRS. Clearly, over the last couple of years, there's been quite a massive increase in the amount of COVID related data sets. Um, so some of them are standalone, which uh, which is sort of fairly self explanatory, and, and others where we we've, we've we've linked data sets together um, to 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 enable sort of uh, enhanced research insight. So they're listed there. Uh, also worth noting, seeing that, 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 that no, noting that there's other data sets like census of, that, that have got health variables in them. Final slide, I think is so it's just in terms of finding out what's available in the SRS we've now got a, a new uh, metadata catalog and uh, you, you you can search and, and see the different data sets you get a, a breakdown at the variable level which is which is really important uh, to help you uh, decide whether that data set is going to be useful for your research needs um, and I think that's all I was going to say there's one other slide about the access levels but I don't need to talk about that there's, there's two models but uh, I'll stop there Thanks very much, Bill. That's great. Um, and then across to Wales um, to Chris Orton to tell us about Seal Data Bank. Yeah, thank you very much, Lara. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Chris Orton, so I'm a program manager based at Swansea University for, uh, for the population data science team. And the SAIL Data Bank, which I'm going to go through today, is the trusted research environment primarily for Wales. Uh, so next slide, please, Lara. So Sale Data Bank was uh, set up in 2007 originally and uh, is essentially a safe, legal and publicly acceptable response to opening access to um, anonymised records for the Welsh population. It started just with the population of Swansea and the local health board and then has become whole Wales over the last 15 years. Um, we host citizen-centric individual level data at scale and link together health and social data from across the public sector in Wales, working primarily with our data provider, which is Digital Health and Care Wales, who are the informatics arm of the NHS in Wales. Uh, but we also have worked across the pandemic in a number of the COVID-19 studies that have been supported and funded by National Core Studies uh, to host UK-wide data within the SAIL data bank because of the level of accreditations uh, and security that we can help provide for that basis. So the data that we actually host is available for bona fide researchers for any legitimate publicly beneficial purpose. And as Bill and others have already mentioned, we also have a governance process where an independent panel scrutinise the applications for data for various research reasons. And that includes lay representation, clinicians and scientific overview. Uh, we continue very much uh, a strong theme of public engagement in sales. So we have a consumer panel as well as having the lay representation. And we also go out to consultation regularly for any developments, particularly on data that we're bringing into the environment. Uh, to make sure that this is in line with public policy and recently with uh, moving into the space of providing our systems as an infrastructure we've also rolled out our technology and sale to Canada and Australia uh, as well as helping the Northern Ireland team come online uh, with an instance to share data as well uh, in the SERP infrastructure which we host which is the secure e-research platform next slide please Lara so just to go over a few of the points, so um, the governance model and privacy protection really is the, the, the keystone for sale in terms of how to functionally anonymize data working with a trusted third party. So we are not the NHS in sale. Um, Oops, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we're not the NHS in sales, so we're an academic group who are based at Swansea University, um, and so the data that we receive is uh, de-identified and then it is encrypted again to make sure that the data is also uh, suppressed to a certain level that can be um, functionally anonymised for research purposes. Uh, anything coming out of the environment in terms of the results, much like with the SRS, as was described by Bill, uh, are scrutinised by a data out team, uh, and this, is, as we have more projects and more projects, is getting uh, a heavier and heavier task in terms of looking over the science that's coming out of the system.
system. Uh, everything is remote access in sales. So we have a virtual desktop infrastructure, which again is non-internet connecting, but it is, it is customizable in terms of package downloads, uh, connecting out to libraries and various things like that in terms of customizing software such as R and Python. Um, we host the data for Wales, as I mentioned, this at the moment represents about 5 million people across the 20 years of health history that we have, which is 32 billion records or so. Um, but it also involves social care, administrative data as well with our work with the Administrative Data Research Network. And as I mentioned earlier, we also work with non-Welsh um, and research organisations as well to host their data within the trusted research environment. The uh, the only other thing to mention is that SAIL uh, is the founding sort of partner of the UK SERP infrastructure, and this has been funded by the Medical Research Council and a number of other initiatives to deduplicate sale as a re research host for Welsh data to um, create the same infrastructure for any research organisation who may want to take this to to sort of form their own governance and understanding. And this brings in a lot of bolt on capabilities such as omics, imaging, natural language processing and uh, geographical uh, infrastructure as well. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and I'll hand over to Carol from the Scottish National Data Safety Haven. Hi, yeah, I'm Carol Morris. I'm uh, Head of Data Modelling Services at Public Health Scotland. And within my portfolio is oversight of the Scottish National Safe Haven slash trusted research environment. So our current incarnation was established in around about 2015. Um, it's governed by Public Health Scotland, and we work with our partners at University of Edinburgh and in the EPCC computational team who operate the National Safe Haven on our, our behalf. So we host a number of uh, key Public Health Scotland data sets. These are kind of nationally collected data sets pulled from across the NHS boards in Scotland international data sets for use in analytics and research. We also work closely alongside Administrative Data Research UK and are expanding our hostings to include non-health data sets. I'll talk a bit, bit more about that in, in the next couple of slides. So we have a wraparound service, uh, which colleagues have kind of talked about um, in similar to the other TREs. Um, and we will handhold people through their uh, projects from an idea to the end. So in terms of what data we are hosting, we kind of have what we call the cradle to grave. So we have everything kind of from uh, antenatal records in hospitals, birth registration records, child health surveillance through hospitalisation, screening um, up until death. And we're working on uh, uh, getting hold of other national data sets such as GP data and laboratories data. Within Scotland, we have a community health index number, which allows us to link data sets together quite easily. So we have now within the National Safe Haven, uh, census 2020, <clears throat> excuse me, 2011 data and 2001 data. And we also host education data from the Scottish government as well. And we can also bring in external data sets to link to the health data or provide some linkage support if people are looking for data to be linked together. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll not go over too much and repeat what the other TREs have talked about. Um, so we also have remote access, but we have secure rooms as well. We have a standard analytical environment with the standard packages, but we also have an isolated zone where we can bring in custom uh, software and we can provide other uh, computational um, power and software for projects. So as I said, the IDRIS team does help with their wraparound. So looking at project feasibility, data requirements, helping with data access permissions, data linkage, data provisioning, and of course, as others have talked about, ensuring that disclosure of any outputs from the secure lockdown environment takes place. Um, if you're looking for information on our data sets, they are available on the HDR UK gateway, um, as well as locally on Public Health Scotland's website as well. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Carol. Um, and then quickly over to Alan Harkinson, who leads the Honest Broker Service in Northern Ireland. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. Um, so, yes, as mentioned, I work in the Honest Broker Service, which is embedded in Health and Social Care in Northern Ireland. 
Uh, we work very closely with the HSC Trust and the Department of Health and other um, health bodies in Northern Ireland around provision of health data, both to internal users for service evaluation and clinical audit and to external users for research. The sorts of data that we have available would be very similar to a lot of the other trusted research environments in terms of um, medical registration card data, which acts as the population spine for Northern Ireland, uh, community prescribing data, hospitalization data, laboratory data, and uh, more recently during COVID, uh, the vaccination data and testing data. Um, next slide, please. So um, we also work on the Privacy Framework. Um, the Honest Broker Service is managed by a governance board, uh, which is made up of representation from key, key HSE stakeholders, um, R&D offices, uh, ethicists, and a lay member. And we sort of, the Honest Broker Service team provides the wraparound service where we help researchers through um, understanding the data, meeting with them, sort of helping them understand the application process and then through to that going to panel and then the sort of extraction, linkage, anonymization of data and then the provision of the data in a safe haven. And then finally, the sort of clearance of all outputs from the research to make sure that participants can be identified at any stage of the process. So um, next slide, please. Um, as mentioned, um, we have quite recently set up a tenancy of the UK Secure e-Research platform. So this is in collaboration with Swansea University and it uses the same technology that underpins the SEAL data bank. But um, having your own tenancy um, keeps a lot of sort of process control within your own governance frameworks. So um, our team manage all the user accounts, set up project areas, and all the sort of data in and data out and sort of output checking processes. And it um, offers remote access via virtual desktop infrastructure, which is um, very secure and sort of um, researchers can access their sort of project data through that and have a collaborative working environment with the rest of their team and have the ability to sort of um, analyze data using a range of sort of the sort of key research analytics packages, uh, including R and um, data. So that has been absolutely fantastic. And it's been a real key enabler for Northern Ireland and the Honest Broker Service to take part in the Four Nation studies that have presented today. So that has been a real significant breakthrough for us. Um, next slide, please. Um, Health and Social Care Northern Ireland is one of the Alliance partners on the data and connectivity program of work. So. We've worked really closely with HDR UK around the development of the gateway, and we have um, a collection on the gateway. So you can browse the Honest Broker Service metadata, and you can actually submit inquiries through that if you're interested in the data. And then we we will pick those up and come back to you and speak to you about potential projects. And then you can, um, it's an end-to-end -end process uh, for data access requests as well. So you can submit applications when you're ready as well via the gateway. So. Uh, please do check that out if you're interested or if you have any other questions, just the, the next slide is just our uh, email contact for our team. Okay. Thanks. I put those at the end, um, Alan, so everyone's got them all together. Great. Thank you. Um, we're going to pass over to Rebecca um, from Q Research at the moment, um, which is led by Julia Hipperstie-Cox at the University of Oxford. Hi, thanks, Lara. I'm Rebecca Burrow, the Senior Research Data Manager for Q-Research, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the data that we hold, how to access it, and our trusted research environment. And I'm going to start with this diagram on the right, which shows the data sets we hold. In the middle, you can see the GP data, to which all our other data sets are linked. So in the GP data, we have all the coded data, the things like demographics, diagnoses, symptoms, clinical values, and prescriptions. We have data for, from over 30 years, from more than 35 million patient records and from um, over 1500 general practices. Um, and the GP data is linked to all of these other circles around it. So the HES data, hospital episode statistics, we've got outpatients, admitted patient care and uh, adult critical care. We have data on cancer from the cancer registry from SACT and RTDS. So the systemic anti-cancer therapy data set and the national radiotherapy data set. 
We have data on COVID testing and vaccination from the National Immunization Management Service. We have uh, data on deaths, cause of death and date from the civil registry. And we have some data on intensive care units from the from ICNARC, the Intensive Care National Audit and Research Center. The data we have is already linked and anonymized, so researchers don't need to worry about that. And we provide access to subsets of these data sets for specific research projects. Next slide, please. So we have just one process to access all these data sets, and the process includes providing a costing for your grant applications and just a one review by our scientific committee who have delegated ethics. We found that researchers are able to access, we're able to provide access to researchers within six weeks of approval by our scientific committee, and we provide support to researchers throughout the process. There's a big change, um, which is that since September this year, researchers at all UK universities are able to access all of the linkages I've just described. So I'm going to tell you a bit about our research environment. We have QWeb, which is a collaborative environment for making applications and developing data specifications and for sharing code groups. And we also have our trusted research environment, which is um, a secure um, server uh, similar with similar security measures to those that have already been described by others. Um, it's held by the University of Oxford. On, on it, we provide access to the project data sets and to the software that researchers require, things like Stata, R, Python. Um, and only approved researchers are able to access that server. Um, there's a little bit more information about the data we hold on the HDI UK Innovation Gateway, and I've put a link in the slides. And we also have guides on how to use QWeb on our website, and I've put a link in for those too. I've put up our website and our email address in case you're interested in finding out more about Q Research or using Q Research in your research. Please do get in touch. And this last slide, thanks, Lara, is just examples of some of the work that's already been done using Q Research. And if you keep clicking, they should appear. I think that's a, an animation gone wrong. We'll keep going. There should be about six. That's it. Thank you. And I just want to say thank you to HDI UK for their support. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, and it's been really good to work with you, Research, um, most recently, and, um, and get you guys onto the gateway. Um, next, I'm going to move across to the UK Longitudinal Linkage Collaboration. And I think we've got Andy Boyd and Robin Flake here. But I think that you're doing the presentation, Robin. I think that's right. So, hi, I'm Robin Flake. I'm based at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm Deputy Director of the UK Longitudinal Linkage Collaboration, or the UK LLC. Um, and Andy Boyd, our director, is on the call as well, um, and he's based at the University of Bristol. We're funded as part of the National Core Studies, uh, the Longitudinal Health and Wellbeing National Core Study, and have worked quite closely with data and connectivity throughout the course of our development. So the UKLC is a new research infrastructure hosted in a trusted research environment based at the University of Swansea. Um, you can see all of the different studies that are part of the UKLLC, um, and uh, in order to access the data from these studies and also link data, which I'll get into on the next slide, uh, we use a five safes model. Uh, currently, we're only um, allowed to, to allow access for COVID research, but it is free. Um, all users must be UK based and ONS approved. Um, and we have public benefit um, assessments with public review. Uh, and each study approves the release of their own data. So it takes about six weeks from application submission to uh, approval. And that's because each, each free study you apply for, their access committee also has to review the application and approve the release of the research. We also have delegated uh, review authority from NHS Digital. And that panel also um, includes some of the study, any study representative who wishes to attend. And we have a public review panel, which researchers present to. We have a requirement for reproducible research, light touch research user IT security framework, um, similar to what would be is done for sale because it is hosted on the same secure research platform at University of Swansea. We have our ISO certification and are getting our Digital Economy Act certification underway. Um, we have a signed data access agreement for each application and also each user has to sign an agreement as well. Currently we're funded until uh, the end of May 2023. However, we have a, a five year funding application in currently and we hope to know by March that we have an additional five years funding and we can open up beyond COVID-19 research. So beyond the study data, can I have the next slide please? Um, this is kind of a map of the data we hold. So we hold 
20 plus longitudinal population studies data for 280,000 participants, and this number will hopefully grow. Uh, we hold their COVID-19 collections, so all of the studies in the UKLC did uh, questionnaires during the pandemic, but also another requirement was that they had to hold pre-pandemic data, so it allows you to do things like assessments of mental health pre-pandemic, pre during the pandemic, and hopefully post-pandemic as well. We have baseline physical and mental health measures and baseline life course indicators. We also hold the previously discussed NHS COVID-19 data sets um, that everybody else has detailed so well and the wider NHS data sets as well, the inpatient cancer mortality, prescribing, um, and, and, the, and the various um, community mental health data. Um, we also are in the process of getting access to administrative records. So from HMRC, DWP and Department of Education. Um, and we would expect that data, assuming we're still funded to be available in January, 2024. We also will have, in, have environmental and neighborhood data. We have some basic data now, SCS, demographic and service provision, but we would expect for a, a group of studies, uh, air pollution, noise and green space data will be available in January. Uh, you can start the application process by submitting uh, an inquiry on the gateway on our on our page or uh, check out our website, which is ukllc.ac.uk. And I forgot to put on the slide, so my apologies. I've got it at the end, uh, an end slide, and we'll send Thanks, that. Thanks, Lara. Um, right, over to Ben um, from Open Safely. Thank you. Hey, thanks, all, and thanks for having us. Um, so, oh, can you go forward to the slide about us? Thanks. Um, so, uh, my name is Ben Goldacre. I run uh, the Bennett Institute at the University of Oxford, and our principal preoccupation is platform science. So, it's the methods for curation and federated analytics and reproducible research that we're particularly interested in. And so, that's why we've built tools and services like Open Safely. So Open Safely is a open source software project that can be built in any environment that contains data and turns it into a very robust TRE, which is also um, with very strong privacy protections, very well trusted by the community. And by putting in place these additional privacy safeguards, we've been able to get access to an unprecedented volume of data. And that's what I'll focus on in particular today. So we've got 58 million patients GP data. That's over 99% of the current living population. It's all but 99, all but 59 practices in England. Uh, that's in near real time where we need it. So we can do refreshes um, whenever we want to. Um, and if you're covering long time periods, of course, because people are born and die, it goes above 58 million. We've got primary care data. So that's all structured GP data, every diagnosis, test, prescription, referral, and so on. Also lots of appointments and bookings data, which we're looking at a lot at the moment for uh, winter pressures work. And these are the raw GP records, not the GPES data that's in NHS digital and ONS. So it's about 10 times as many rows of data. We've also got that linked onto key health data sets as needed. So we've got inpatient HES and SUS, outpatient HES and SUS. We've got A&E presentations in ECDS SUS. We've got ONS death, we've got COVID tests and vaccinations. We've created our own household identifier, which we've used to look at risks clustered within households, a care home identifier to look at risks in care homes. And then we've also got research data sets. So we've got a bring your own data service. We've imported and linked on the ONS COVID infection survey. We've got a patient reported outcomes app, which we're using to create patient reported outcomes data on um, for a health economics project. We've ingested the UK renal registry and we've also ingested a trial randomization schedule so that we can uh, follow up randomized trial patients. Next slide, please. So this is a description of how the platform works and we don't need to talk about it today, but it's there just for interest when we circulate slides. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of our outputs, we've got over 30 completed published research outputs in journals in Nature, Lancet, BMJ, the other glamorous places that people like, but also lots in other journals too. And we've done reports to JCBI, NHS England, and so on. And topics include COVID-19 risks and Nature paper, ethnicity and COVID risk in Lancet, household COVID risks, BMJ. We've got pharmacoepi risks and benefits in COVID. We've done work on coverage and effectiveness for monoclonals and antivirals in COVID. 
We published work on vaccine effectiveness, vaccine coverage and vaccine safety. We published work on consequences of COVID infection, including long COVID and also changes in clinical activity during and after the pandemic. And then we've done a lot of NHS service monitoring work, which is an increasing focus for us because that's where um, it's looking like a lot of our funding is coming from in the future. And then next page, please. Lastly, just around our users, so very broad user community, over 100 users, 125 approved projects, 44 from external users, lots of output checkers. We've got a co-pilot service where people get hands-on um, uh, assistance to get their project up and running. We've got close collaborators, and those are people who are interested in doing their own projects, but also contributing to our platform science work on data curation different methods for automated federated analytics, which is how we link up the data in TPP and EMIS. And then we've got our external users pilot program, 22 organizations with outputs coming through from Manchester and Essex and other universities, and also work from NICE, UXA and NHS. Uh, so you can do a form online. There's a link in the slides to get access. We've got a full user manual online. You can read about our user support service, and we've got some point and click tools as well. Lastly, practically, we're coming to the end of our funding to support external users, but I'm confident that we'll be able to get more and keep as many of you coming through as we can manage. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Ben. Um, and thank you, everyone, for um, the Office of Top Stewards tours that were really effective um, and a huge amount of information. Um, so I'm just going to pull out um, some initial questions from the chat. There's some questions that specifically around data. Um, and data available within um, the TREs, but also some quite interesting questions around um, kind of onboarding for people that haven't worked in TREs before, especially um, PhD students, et cetera. So I'm quite keen to pick that up as well. Um, so first of all, I think I'll go to um, Bill and Robin first um, to pick up the first question around socioeconomic and demographic data that's available within TREs for COVID-19 patients. Um, do you want me to go first? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, we do have that data from our volunteers and we actually have it over time as well. Um, and self-report as well as uh, linked data to it. Yeah, it is available in our, in our TRE. Great. And I think, um, thank you, Robin. And I think that the obvious the next one is, is the ONS bill. Did you maybe want to give a summary of that, especially around socioeconomic data? Yeah, I mean, as you'd expect, we, we hold a lot of um, socioeconomic data in, in the SRS. Um, clearly, um, census is, 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 is the big one um, and, and various other, um, you know, labor market um, and, and business type survey. So, um, in fact, you know, the SRS holds most of ONS survey data. So that the whole, whole range of stuff there that you could bring in alongside um, the, the the COVID and health data, depending on your project. But I think the best place to look is that that metadata catalogue. Great, thanks, Phil. I'm going to be giving a links in and demo of that um, in the next session. Um, and the and the next um, questions are focused on um, um, the clinical data mainly. So I'm going to pull in Kimberly, um, Helen, and Kathy for this question. Um, so there's a question around um, HES data. Um, so what does it include? Does it link with patient level data on an individual basis for inpatients or is it based on coding? Um, and I guess maybe if Helen can just start by giving a quick summary of HES data and, um, and the descriptive metadata. And then maybe Cathy, maybe just giving a really quick summary on the kind of strengths and limitations of HES. Is that okay, Helen, I'll go to you first. Oh, oh, Kimberly. Okay. I, was, I was on mute then. <laughs> Kimberly, I don't know whether you want to answer this or not. Um, so, limited experience of the capability of HES data, so it may be something that we need to take away, Kimberly. Um, but HES data obviously comes with sort of in, in four sections. So, we have the HES APC, OP, outpatient, critical care, and accident and emergency. Um, Kimberly, do you have any further detail on? Yeah, I think so, gosh, sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, so you've got a num you've got like the four main HES data sets, which is what Helen's just described. And I think the question was around sort of linking at patient level. So yeah, so the HES data is linked at patient level 
to a number of other data sets depending on the applicant's request. So it can be linked, sort of a cohort can be submitted and we can link the sort of um, detail from the HES data sets if you were only interested in a specific diagnosis, that kind of thing. I don't know, does that answer the question or was it more around sort of specific coding? Maybe, Laura, if I come in just to sort yeah. of embellish for the sort of um, uh, maybe the more kind of research, clinical research orientated people. So, um, uh, and, and others could comment as well, I'm sure, who's used HES. But basically, the, so the, the HES data sets, um, as Kimberly's uh, uh, very rightly pointed out, have inpatient, an inpatient subset, an outpatient subset. There's a, a maternity subset and an A&E or emergency care data set subset. They've changed somewhat in format over the years. The data sets go back um, with pretty good coverage and quality to 1997. And certainly in the BHF Data Science Center instance of the NHS digital TRE in its current form, um, the entire population of England uh, worth of HES is linked to all of the other data sets that, that Lynn showed you earlier on that hadn't previously been done within NHS digital before we um, uh, started working with them early on uh, during the pandemic. And the the the, the basically the kind of information that's available within those data sets are coded diagnoses, largely coded to ICD and a number of other uh, proprietary um, formats, which have changed somewhat over time. Uh, but dates of these events, um, dates of hospital admissions and so on. And the richest diagnostic coding is in the inpatient or admitted patient care data. The, the diagnostic coding is, is much more limited in the outpatient data. Um, it's pretty good in the emergency department data as well, but it uses a slightly different format. Um, and the other thing to say is that the other information that's coded within these data sets are operations and procedures using something called the OPCS4, which is a coding system for operations and procedures. A lot of other rows of data give information on administrative uh, information, for example, um, where people were admitted from, where they were discharged to, um, and so on, and uh, health-related groups for outpatients, or what kind of department the person was seen under. This type of information can be really helpful for a number of other types of analyses, uh, and, and uh, Ben Goldacre earlier on was referring to winter pressures analyses, so some of those types of analyses, particularly health economic analyses, can be conducted using these data sets. I think within HES inpatients, there are 330 rows of data, but probably a relatively small subset of those rows, uh, sorry, 330 columns of data, if you think in terms of columns and rows, but a relatively small subset of those would be used in any particular research study and a relatively small subset will be used in most research studies. Thanks, Kathy. Um, and then there's a couple of questions around imaging data, um, specifically um, um, digital imaging data set. Are there any plans to bring that into NHS Digital as a as a requestable data set or the um, CBD COVID consortia? So, I think the diagnostic imaging data set is a requestable data set within DARS, um, has been for some time. Um, it, there have been um, capacity issues within N NHS Digital that have limited the ability to rapidly provision all the data sets that the research community might regard as desirable into the TRE or um, for for linkage, but I think it's on our it's on our wish list, isn't it, Kimberly? Um, it's one of the data sets that we thought would be extremely useful to track uh, imaging use and its linkage to other um, uh, to other data sets during the course of the pandemic and beyond. Yeah, so it is available. It's one of the data sets that's available to a request as an extract at the moment, and it's on the sort of list for provisioning into the TRE. Great, thank you. That's great. Um, and I'm going to move across actually to um, new researchers working in TREs and, and pull out some of the concerns and questions around that. Um, so a couple of people have asked around, you know, is it more difficult to browse data within TREs? This may have an impact for people unfamiliar with data sets. Um, and then also picking up the point around um, kind of PhD students who usually use um, um, kind of the internet to look up stata and code when obviously the restrictions of a traditional TRE mean that they can't access the internet within that environment. Um, so I'm going to um, pick on Ben Goldacre first, I think, um, to talk about you know, how 
and platforms that can safely um, use re reusable code um, and, and how that's helpful in onboarding new researchers. And then open that up to, to any other the TOEs who'd like to come in on that question. Yeah, so um, I typed an answer in the chat. You can read the user manual of how Open Safety works at, at docs.opensafety.org. We're slightly different from most other TREs. I think in most TREs, you go into a remote desktop environment where you can interact with the raw data. We've avoided that because that didn't provide sufficient privacy safeguards for some of the communities that express strong views on us accessing data like RCGP, BMA and privacy campaigners like Med Confidential. So we've got an additional layer of security, which is that researchers developed their code on GitHub using dummy data that's generated bespoke for them. And that dummy data looks just like the real data that they'll be using in their analysis. That means that they're free to develop their code outside of the TRE. And then when their code for data curation and data analysis and visualization is ready to execute, you press a button and it goes off and it runs inside the secure environment without any researcher ever needing to have tinkering access with the raw data. Now, although that was motivated by a need to bring better privacy safeguards, it also actually brings quite a lot of good workflow benefits because developing your code interactively and iteratively on GitHub is best practice for writing large complicated blocks of code in any case. It avoids some of the problems raised in the Q&A around not being able to access resources like Google while you're iteratively developing your code because you don't have any of those barriers. It's also um, one of the things that's allowed us to standardize the data curation. And by standardizing the data curation processes that people use, that's been one of the things that's made the platform so productive because each new user can read and understand and then reuse if they wish to all previous users code for curation and for analysis. And then lastly, it's one of the things that helps on federated analytics, because you write your code for data curation and analysis once in the open safely curation language, and then that gets sent out to wherever you're executing it. So it gets sent out to EMIS to run on 35 million patients data, gets sent to TPP to run on 23 million patients data there. And with our newer, um, uh, implementations in places like GraphNet, it can run out on integrated care system data locally. Um, so that's open safety and how it's a little different. Um, if anyone's got any questions, happy to do them offline. And there is appallingly long-winded, comprehensive technical <laughs> documentation for the platform at docs.opensafety.org. That's good. We'll definitely be sharing all the links there. Um, does anyone else want to come in on that question, specifically around kind of onboarding new um, researchers and PhD students who are newer to working in TREs. Um, perhaps, um, Chris, uh, I'll go to Andy first, actually, as you put your hand up. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, thanks, Lara. Yeah, so it's a really good question. Uh, one of the, the sort of most important jobs of a TRE is to make user um, sort of efficiencies and access and accessibility as uh, you know as slick a process as possible one of the ways we do this in llc is by offering what we call helper files so they're pre-bundled um, sets of software code in r python and stata although we can host specialist software as well and that has um, pre-written code for commonly used tasks we've got a gitlab within the tre which uh, is available to recycle and repurpose commonly used um, code developed by other users and syntax on derived variables and so on. So I think these reproducible code libraries uh, within the TRE settings, we need to really ensure that these are comprehensive and um, you know, make the whole user experience a lot easier and a lot more straightforward. Thanks, Andy, that's really helpful. I'm gonna go with Rebecca next, if you research and then Kathy. Hi, yeah, so um, people can upload code to our TRE um, and also, so what I do, so I also look up code occasionally when I'm, I'm working on something I'm writing. You have the remote desktop which links to the server on one window and you're Googling on your own computer on the other, write some code on your computer and then upload it to the TRE and see how it goes. Um, and that's working with the raw data. The projects in our server are all siloed so that the um, researchers can only access the projects and the data that they, they have um, specific access for, but we can transfer code between projects for them, um, obviously checking that the 
they don't contain any data first. So that's how we cope with that. Thanks, Rebecca. Oh, sorry, I want to say we do actually have, um, sorry, five PhD students at the moment successfully so far completing their PhDs um, using Q Research. So it is possible even for people who are, are new to it to succeed. That's great. Um, that's really helpful, actually, Rebecca. Um, I'll go to Kathy next. Yeah, just uh, so two things to say. One is that um, I think many of us have been taking uh, leaves out of Ben's book and trying to work increasingly in an open science and reproducible curation and analytic pipeline way. So thanks very much to Ben for all the work he's done on showing the community best practice. Um, within the NHS Digital TRE, which is, as, as you know, pretty new, um, and we've been lucky enough to co-develop it and occupy the first instance of it in its first iteration and involved in its developments. Um, it's been possible to work jointly with NHS Digital and their data wrangler team and put in place an increasing health data science team to provide support to new researchers encountering the environment, certainly under, under our kind of purview, uh, which is a very uh, open process for, for all users who have a project to propose. Um, providing an increase, an increasingly a sort of rich range of curation uh, tools and repeatable uh, code that can be reused for multiple projects. Again, a sort of following uh, guidance um, and principles developed by others, um, and making sure that all the code that is developed um, is made available in the open as soon as possible. So we we provide an increasing. Um, a uh, panoply of support mechanisms to help researchers hit the ground running. But I guess some of the researchers who've spoken, perhaps in particular, Joanna and team and others who are working with us are, are the best kind of commentators on how well that process works and has in, um, improved over time. Absolutely, thank you. That's great, Cathy. Um, we've, we could um, be here all afternoon, actually. We <laughs> answer questions because there's a lot of really good questions, um, but we are running out of time. So I'm gonna do one more, actually. Um, and that's about um, the National Cancer Registry data, because we, it's, it's a data set we've had a lot of questions about recently within data and connectivity and, and the availability of that. Um, Julia, shall I go to you first? Because I know that Q Research do hold um, National Cancer Registry data, and then we'd be interested to know. Um, yes, so uh, afternoon, everybody. So I dropped off the call just then because of a connection problem. Is the question about what, what the availability is of yes. registry? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so in the Q Research uh, TRE, we've got uh, information on the cancer registry going back to 1990, which includes uh, uh, the stage of cancer, the type of cancer, uh, the histological type, um, the grade, uh, how it was diagnosed, whether it was on a two-week wait or on, on a hospital admission or, or by the GP, uh, whether it was the cause of death um, or not. Um, and on the linked uh, chemotherapy data set, we've got line listing of every prescription that someone's had for chemotherapy, so we know which type of chemotherapy they've had and when they've had that chemotherapy. And similarly, we have that for the um, radiotherapy data set as well. Um, so th that gives you a really very, um, a, 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 if I forgot to say, the histology as well. So you can, we can look at um, not only saying what type of lung cancer it is, but whether it's a small cell lung cancer or, or an adeno lung cancer or whatever. So that gives an inc incredibly high definition for the, um, for the lung cancer data. And in the, the way that we've done the uh, data linkage means that all that data is already held within our TRE and that on that one application process that Rebecca mentioned, um, you can get access to that data under a sort of sub license agreement that we've got in place with NHS Digital. Um, so I think that that's um, hopefully that answers the question. Lara, please tell me if I need to say any more. Thanks, Julia. Um, and then just I'm just going to answer a final question, and it's just a, it's a comment really. So someone's asked in the um, in the chat that you know um, theories, um, all theories hold um, lots of data. Sometimes they're they're overlapping, and um, processes are difficult for access, etc. Um, and the question was whether theories um, collect feedback from researchers or and users to inform um, improvements in, in feedback. Um, and just a comment that we, we do know that all of the, um, the trusted research environments we work with on the call do this. Um, each of them um, gather quite detailed information. I know specifically ONS and, and SAIL do this um, around um, researcher user feedback. 
And it's something that we've done um, quite closely in data and connectivity with um, research that we've funded. So all throughout that, um, the data access and request process for the 20 odd or so projects we funded, we've, we've obtained really granular detail on um, the user experience. And that's really helped um, our informing and learning around the next steps for streamlining and harmonizing access to data, um, et cetera. Um, so we'll stop there and uh, we'll take all of these questions um, and any that we've not answered, we can follow up and send around with the, with the post-event feedback. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ruth Milner from HDI UK. Um, Ruth is our gateway content leader um, and she's going to walk you through the process and, and how to discover and access all these data sets in the first place via the HDR gateway. Um, I've, I mentioned in the first talk that we had made available 111 national core study data sets available for COVID research, but actually there's over 700 data sets um, on the HDR gateway mode Wi-Fi um, and lots of different data custodians. Um, so over to you, Ruth. Thank you. So um, my um, name is Ruth. Um, I'm from the Gateway team and I'm basically going to take you on a really quick um, intro of the um, health data research innovation um, gateway today and basically share with you um, how it might help you find um, and um, access data sets that are relevant to your research. Um, next slide please. A uh, very quick summary, I'm going to take us through a bit of um, background to the gateway and um, how you might go about searching for data sets um, on the gateway. As Lara mentioned, we've got over 700 data sets on there. Um, and a little bit about how you might um, go about requesting access access to those um, data sets. And then I've just got some um, resources to share with you at the end. OK, there we go. I think a major problem for researchers is accessing data in a timely way and being able to find the data that's that's out there and then being allowed to use the tools that they want um, in order to analyse that data. So it can actually take researchers many months, if not years. At the end of the day, researchers just want to get on with answering research questions and coming out with, with novel insights. They don't want to be spending time uh, writing data governance applications. The HDR UK Gateway will completely transform the way in which people can find data that's out there. Whereas five years ago, it was sort of a, a novel idea. I think. Oh, sorry. People are, are kind of streamlining the process of, of actually linking data sets and providing subsets at, at scale in a reproducible way. And I think the landscape's very much changed with COVID in that people understand the power of data to inform public health decisions and also the priority of, of getting timely access to data in order to carry out research. And so actually a positive outcome from, from COVID is hopefully that they those processes will, will be streamlined um, uh, new architectures will be put in place which still protect patient confidentiality and, and trust but also enable much more timely access to data for other diseases other than COVID. Uh, amazing, I'm just going to stop there. Um, so brilliant words there from Emily Jefferson um, and just a quick note to say that Emily is um, currently the director of um, the Health Informatics Centre at the University of Dundee, um, but I'm pleased to share that she's joining HDR UK as our new CTO in a couple of weeks, so we're very excited for that. Um, but moving on to the gateway, come on. There we go. What is the gateway? So the gateway is essentially a platform or search portal to discover and request access to UK health data sets for research and innovation. Um, we created it because, as we know, the UK is home to some of the richest health information in the world, but it's held in lots of different places by many different organisations. And this means it can be really difficult for researchers to find out what data sets firstly exist and how they might be useful for research. So this is where the gateway comes in to help make health data sets in the UK more um, visible. Um, a few sort of key things, takeaways to know about the gateway. Um, so it doesn't hold 
or store any data sets or patient or health data, but it instead, it instead it, it lists information about each data set. So the data sets metadata. Um, it's not just data sets on the gateway. We have um, other resources on there as well. Um, uh, tools, papers, data uses, advanced search options. Um, the gateway is also public. Um, it's open so anyone can come along and, and search the portal. Um, but to request access to a data set and use some of the other features and functionalities, you need to create an account on the gateway. And I've got a link to be able to do that later on in the um, uh, presentation. Um, and one more thing to mention, um, the gateway is delivered in, in partnership with the UK um, Research Alliance, um, which I, I think was briefly mentioned um, by somebody before. Um, essentially, this is a network of organisations that um, come together to help establish best practices and, and standards for the ethical use of um, health data for research in the UK. And this, of course, includes um, defining and developing standards relating to trusted research environments as well. Um, and just a note to say that most of the data sets um, currently on the, the gateway um, come from Alliance um, uh, members. Uh, OK, so quite a busy slide, but um, I'm just going to just want to give you a very quick snapshot of where we are currently with the gateway since we um, launched it as it is today in, in early 2020. Um, we have almost um, 800 data sets um, on the gateway now, um, plus more than 3,000 um, other resources. And I, as I mentioned before, these include tools and publications um, and data uses as well. Um, and we have almost 2,500 um, registered users um, from across the health data research um, uh, community currently um, using the gateway. Um, so I just wanted to highlight this um, timeline as a way to show the development um, journey and progress of, of the, the gateway um, that, that it's made since we launched it in early 2020, which of course coincided with the um, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and as an organisation, we were um, of course involved in the UK's response to COVID-19 so that we could focus research efforts and um, uh, fast track access to some of the vital um, data assets across the country. Um, this, of course, included the gateway and its development, um, basically pivoted to support all of this work um, uh, so that we could rapidly onboard the um, high priority data sets um, and streamline access to them via the trusted research environments that we've heard about um, today, that part of the um, data and data and connectivity program. Um, the link at the bottom here takes you to a very readable um, description about all of these highlights. Here, I'd, I'd recommend um, taking a quick look at that. Um, okay, so moving on to discovering data sets um, on the gateway. So, how you might go about finding a data set on the gateway. Um, I'm going to show you two um, ways to do this. The first is through a, a, a keyword and filter search. And then the second is through a, a, a more curated approach to um, uh, discovering data sets um, on the gateway. So firstly, the keyword and filter search. So here um, I've come onto the gateway homepage and on the um, search bar at the top of the page, I've entered COVID-19 as my search term. Um, I've then sorted by um, best match using the sort filter on the right hand side of the screen there. Um, and then I've also filtered by um, publisher um, halfway down on the left side of the screen. Um, you can see that I've um, filtered for Public Health Scotland. What we mean by publisher is the data custodian, essentially. So my um, publisher is Public Health Scotland um, in this example. And so what this has done has narrowed my initial single keyword search, uh, which it's not shown on the slide, that generated 
uh, 168 data sets, I think, from memory. Um, but what I've done to filter it down, those couple of sort and, and filter opt-ins, that's narrowed my search down to 19 data sets to, to browse through. So it's a, it's a bit easier to find what you're looking for. And there are, again, um, it, it's not shown on this slide, but there are other filtering options that you can use, perhaps to narrow it down further. There's um, and These are all on the left-hand side. Um, uh, of the gateway portal when when you go and have a look. Um, you could do further filtering with other keywords, um, phenotypes, um, spatial coverage. There, there's um, different ones you can try. So if I then um, click into the top data set that you can see on my search results there, the um, Scottish COVID-19 vaccination data, um, this is what the data set page looks like. So it just gives you a lot more information about the data set. Basically, it's all of the um, metadata that's been entered by the data custodian when they um, onboarded the data set to um, the gateway. So that's the, the first method of um, search and discovery on the gateway. Um, the second, um, and I think we did, men um, somebody mentioned this in uh, one of the earlier slides, um, is through what we call collections. Um, so a collection um, on the gateway is basically a curated list of resources around a particular topic. Um, and this can include data sets, but um, it's also other things like publications again, tools, data uses. So you can collect them all together and, and build a, a collective resource. So my example here, is a collection around um, trusted research um, environments and clicking on one of those cards will show you the data sets and um, other uh, assets that's listed under that um, TRE. Um, another example that I would encourage everyone to go and have a look at is the data and connectivity um, collection. So that is currently home to just over 600 resources. Um, and I think I think there's 110 um, data, it's either 110 or 111, I, I can't remember which one, um, as part of that collection. So do have a look at uh, um, both of those. The, the links are here and also um, at the end. Um, so my next couple of slides will focus on um, how the gateway is supporting um, access. Uh, the access request process to health data. So one of the um, key objectives with the gateway when, when we essentially got going is to help simplify or streamline the data access request process um, for both data custodians and the data applicant to facilitate a sort of faster and smoother process to access health data for um, research. So um, not not easy to us. So we have nearly 800 data sets currently on the gateway, um, and all of which can be inquired about in terms of um, gaining access to them. I'm just going to show you now what that looks like on the gateway as if you were inquiring about a data set that you were interested in accessing for research. So this is my data set from earlier, my Scottish COVID-19 vaccination um, data. So you found it, um, it's useful, you think it's going to be useful, you want to inquire about accessing to it. So you can click on the how to access, how to request access button at the top um, right hand corner there. Um, and this invites you to either um, make an inquiry or start an application. So just to explain, all data sets on the gateway have a simple inquiry form that um, looks like this, um, which is essentially a messaging service that puts you in direct content with the uh, direct contact with the data custodian um, responsible for that particular data set. But some data sets um, you can apply to access them within the gateway platform itself by um, completing and submitting um, our five safe data access request form. Um, so the entire application process is managed within the help, the, the gateway itself. Um, and this is what that form looks like. 
so it's a little different. It, it splits into several different sections that you can see on the right, um, on the left hand side there, sorry. Um, and it's um, built on the um, five safes um, framework as well. So you can see it's split by people, project data, settings and outputs. And then there's some additional um, sections as well that are required to be filled in. Um, OK, so this slide basically um, sorry, just we're, we're going to need to finish up for last comments. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's OK. What well, this yeah. this um, basically there's so much to say, isn't it? Basically summarizes the the previous slides, which is there's two routes to access um, uh, data data sets on the gateway. And then my final two slides was just um, there were just a summary and some resources and how to create an account um, and to find out more information as well. So I'm very happy to um, stop there if that's helpful, Laura. Let me stop stop sharing. Okay. That was great. No, thank you. That was really helpful, Ruth. And I think it kind of brings together um, um, how to um, discover and access data. Um, so just a, a kind of few final comments from me and, um, and then I'll pass on to Mark. Um, first, a huge thank you to all the panellists um, and all the um, attendees today. Um, we're aware that it's a huge amount of information, but we really wanted to kind of give you a whistle-stop sewer of the, the UK health data infrastructure um, as it is now and the breadth and of data sets that are available to access and request. Um, and thanks very much to Ruth for giving that introduction to, um, um, to how to access data via the gateway. Um, and to all attendees, we've said in the, um, in the Q&A, but we'll be sending out um, presentations from today, all of the links, all of the contact details for everyone that you've heard from today and all of those um, trusted research environments and linked data assets. Um, and then also uh, instructions and links on how to find and access that data via the gateway. Um, so huge thanks. Um, and I'll just pass over to Mark um, to see if you've got any final comments. Uh, thanks, Lara. Yeah, well, just want to reiterate a um, uh, huge thanks to all of our contributors today. Um, as you say, it was a real whistle-stop tour and uh, extremely uh, valuable. And, and thanks again to all attendees um, who have uh, taken time to join uh, join the session. I mean, I think really what it's demonstrated is that there's a, a huge wealth of really great data resources um, out there that are already sort of highly productive in feeding what is really a burgeoning set of, uh, of research outputs. And, and the resources are being managed by fantastic teams of experts across the country who, who are really, really up for, for, for collaboration. So I'd really just sort of encourage researchers um, to, to, to take the plunge, to sort of dive in and, and, and get involved so that we can really see you know, even more benefits being created for, for patients um, from, uh, from our, our data-driven research. So um, yeah, just thanks very much and back to you, Lara. Great, thank you very much, Mark. Um, so we'll be in contact um, with all the attendees for today and, and huge thanks again to our panellists. Um, and I can, I think I can talk for all of them when I say that they're really happy to receive inquiries um, from researchers who are interested in accessing data. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.